It's good methodological practice whenever you're starting to build new models to start by evaluating very simple models, which establish baselines to which you can then compare the more sophisticated models that you're going to build later on. So to do that, we're going to start by looking at three simple models, a random guesser, a very simple phrase matching strategy, and then our first machine learning based approach, which will be a simple bag of words classifier. Just about the simplest possible model is one that doesn't even look at the input, but just flips a coin. And I strongly encourage you, whenever you're embarking on a model building adventure in your final project, wherever, start by evaluating a random guesser. It's a snap to implement. It can help to work out the kinks in your test harness. And it's often very informative to put a floor under what good scores look like. Now, we've written an evaluation method for you. It's in the Relix module, and it's just called Evaluate. Uh, you invoke it with your splits, your classifier, and uh, the name of the split that you want to evaluate on, which defaults to dev. When we evaluate our random guesser, we have some interesting results. So we have uh, results separated for each of the relations, and for each one, we have precision, Recall, F score, remember that's F 0.5, which gives more weight to precision than to recall. Uh, we have the support, which is the number of instances whose actual label is true. And we have size, which is just the total number of instances. We find that recall is generally right around 0.5. And this makes sense because recall says of the instances which are actually true, what proportion do we predict true? Well, we predict true about half the time because we're just flipping a coin. Precision, on the other hand, is generally quite poor because precision says of the instances where we predict true, which are basically a random sample because we're just flipping a coin, how many are actually true? Well, relatively few. And actually, you can tell that by looking at the ratio between support and size. The ratio between support and size is how many of the instances are actually true. So when we're cost tossing a coin, the precision should be right around the ratio between support and size. Uh, our F score is also generally poor. It stays close to precision for two reasons. Number one, because the, harmonics, the harmonic mean stays closer to the lower number. And number two, because we're using F0.5, which gives more weight to precision than to recall. And the bottom line, our macro average F score is 9.7%. So that's the number to beat. It's a pretty low bar, but this is a random guesser after all. Okay, so let's look at another approach, which is very simple, but smarter than random guessing. And it's a simple pattern matching strategy. And the idea is for each relation, let's go through the corpus and find the most common phrases that connect two entities that stand in that relation, the most common middles in our terminology. So here's some code that does that. Um, I won't go through it in detail, but one thing to note is that it counts separately the middles that connect subject with object. So here it gets all the examples and um, counts the middles. It tallies up the middles. And it does that separately from the examples that connect object with subject. And it stores them in separate, separate um, dictionaries under the keys forward and reverse. So we're going to have forward middles and reverse middles stored separately, stored and counted separately. If we run that code, here's what we get. Uh, I'm showing results. I'm only going to show results for three of the relations here, not all 16. Um, all 16 are in the, the Python notebook if you want to take a look. But even from this sample, there's a few things that jump out. First, some of the most frequent middles are really natural and intuitive. Uh, for example, comma starring indicates a reverse film performance relation. Um, so that would be one where the film comes first and the actor comes second. Um, 
And I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, Star Wars, comma, starring Mark Hamill. Um, similarly, comma, son of indicates a forward parent's relation. So this would be one where the son comes first, the child comes first, and the parent comes second. So those are extremely intuitive and it's reassuring to see them near the top of the list of uh, most common middles. Another observation is that punctuation and stop words like comma and and are extremely common. Unlike some other NLP applications, it's probably a bad idea to throw these away. They carry lots of useful information. On the other hand, punctuation and stop words tend to be highly ambiguous. Uh, for example, if you look across the full range of all 16 relations, you'll see that a bare comma is a likely middle for almost every relation in at least one direction. So that comma does very often indicate a relation, but it's a really ambiguous indicator. Okay, now that we've identified the most common middles for each relation, it's straightforward to build a classifier based on that information, a classifier that predicts true for a candidate KB triple, just in case the two entities in the triple appear in the corpus connected by one of the phrases that we just discovered. Um, I don't show the code for that here, but it's in the Python notebook for this unit. Um, and when we evaluate this approach, we see some really interesting results. First, recall is much worse across the board. And that makes sense because we're no longer just guessing randomly. Before we were saying true half the time, now we're gonna be a lot more selective about what we say true to. But precision and F-score have improved dramatically for several relations, uh, especially for adjoins and author and has sibling and has spouse. Then again, there are many other relations where precision and F-score are still quite poor, um, including this one genre where we get straight zeros across the board. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, but it indicates that although, although things have improved a lot in some places, uh, they're still rather poor in others. And our macro average F-score has improved only modestly. So it improved from 9.7% to 11.1%. We're heading in the right direction, but you'd have to say that's still pretty unimpressive. To make significant gains, we're gonna need to apply machine learning. So let's get started on that. We're gonna build a very simple classifier using an approach that should be familiar from our look at sentiment analysis last week. Um, and we're gonna start that by defining a very simple bag of words feature function. So here's the code for that. Um, and let me briefly walk you through it. What we're gonna do is to get the features for a KB triple, that's the KBT here. We're gonna find all of the corpus examples containing the two entities in the KB triple, the subject and the object. And note that we do that in both directions, subject, subject and object, and then also object and subject. For each example, we look at the middle, we break it into words, and then we count up all the words. So a couple things to note here. One is that the feature representation for one KB triple can be derived from many corpus examples. And this is the point that I was trying to make uh, last time, that we're using the corpus to generate features for a candidate KB triple. And the role of the corpus is to provide the feature representation. And the feature representation for a KB triple will be based on all of the examples in the corpus that contain those two entities. The other observation to make here is that we make no distinction between what you might call forward examples, which have subject first and then object, and reverse examples, which have object and then subject. We're lumping them all together. The words that come from the middles of examples in either direction all get lumped together into one feature counter. And you might have qualms about whether that's really the smartest thing to do. So let's get a sense of what this looks like in action. Um, first, let's print out the very first KB triple in our KB 
Uh, we actually looked at this last time. It's a KB triple that says that uh, the contains relation holds between Brickfields and Kuala Lumpur Central Rail Railway Station. Um, and now let's look up the first example containing these two entities. So I'm just going to look them up in the forward direction, subject and object. I get all the examples. Uh, I look at the first one and let me just print out the middle. The middle says it was just a quick 10 minute walk too. So I guess the full example probably said something like from Brickfields, it was just a quick 10 minute walk to Kuala Lumpur Central Railway Station. And maybe there was more. Um, now let's run our featureizer on this KB triple and see what features we get. Uh, so we get a counter that contains, it was just a quick 10 minute walk to the, so it looks like it's counted up the words in that middle, which is just what we expected. If, but if you look closely, there's something unexpected here because the word two has a count of two, even though it appears only once in that middle. And also the word the has a count of one, even though it didn't appear in that middle at all. So where did those come from? Well, remember that the featureizer counts words from the middles of all examples containing those entities in either direction. And it turns out that the corpus contains another example containing those two entities. And that other example has, there's just one other example, but that other example has middle to the. And so that's where these counts come from. So all is well, it did the right thing. Okay, we have our simple bag of words featureizer. Now we need a way to train models, to make predictions, and to evaluate the results. Uh, the Relex module contains functions for each of those. And so I just wanna give you a quick tour of what those functions are, but you'll definitely wanna go read the, the code for this so that you're more familiar with uh, how it can be used. And a lot of this code appears in a file called relxt, rel underscore ext dot pi. So we'll start with a function called train models. Uh, this takes as arguments uh, the dictionary of data splits, a list of featureizers, and here we have a list consisting of just our simple bag of words featureizer, the name of the split on which to train, which defaults to train, and a model factory, which is a function that returns a, a, um, a, a classifier, um, and it's... Uh, it, sorry, a function which initializes an SK classifier. And by default, it's a logistic regression classifier as shown here. But you could easily substitute this with some other SK, SK learn classifier. It returns this thing called train result, which is a dictionary holding the featureizers, the vectorizer that was used to generate the training matrix, and most importantly, a dictionary holding the trained models one per relation. So it's a dictionary which maps from relation names to models. So that's train models. Next comes predict. This is a function that takes as arguments a dictionary of data splits. The output of train models, that train results thing, um, and the name of the split on which to make predictions. And by default, that's dev. And it returns two parallel dictionaries. One holds the predictions grouped by relation and the other holds the true labels grouped by relation. And our third building block is evaluate predictions. So this is a function that takes as arguments the two parallel dictionaries of predictions and true labels produced by predict. And it prints evaluation metrics for each relation like we saw earlier. Now, before we dwell on these results, I wanna show one more function, which is uh, a function called experiment. And experiment simply chains together the three functions that I just showed you. It chains together training, prediction, and evaluation. Uh, so that's very convenient for running end-to-end -end experiments. I haven't shown all the parameters here, uh, but if you go look at the source code, you'll see that it actually takes a lot of optional parameters and those parameters let you specify 
everything about how to run the experiment. Let you specify your featureizers, your model factory, which splits to train and test on, and more. So for example, earlier I mentioned that the tiny split is really useful for running fast experiments to work out the kinks. If you wanted to do that, it's very easy using the experiment function just to set the training split and the test split to tiny to run a very quick experiment. Now, here are the results of evaluating uh, our simple bag of words logistic regression classifier. And let's take a closer look because this is quite stunning. Um, even though this is just about the simplest possible classifier, we've achieved huge gains over the phrase matching approach. The first thing that jumps out is that our macro averaged F score has jumped from 11.1 .1 to 56.7. And we see big gains in precision for almost every single relation. Uh, and correspondingly, big gains in F-score. On the other hand, there's still plenty of room for improvement. I mean, this is much, uh, much more impressive than where we were before, but we're very far from perfection. There's abundant headroom and opportunity to continue to improve.